Well, thanks, everyone. And I um, want to thank Ron and the dean and thank my impromptu uh, IV person, IT person. So uh, my name is Alex Kaur. And um, I really appreciate the uh, warm welcome. And over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about uh, my parents. I'm going to talk about myself and kind of put this all together. And then we have a little bit of a surprise guest after I'm done talking. And then, of course, there'll be a Q&A. And so a lot of people will ask me um, about the book and why the title. And um, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, but one of the reasons for the title is that, you know, I think that as a child of Holocaust survivors, I kind of have an obligation of the past. And um, we all have a past, even some of you are in your college age. I think you always want to look to the future and uh, remember the past. And so for me, it's been really important, um, especially since both my parents have passed away in the last five and a half years, um, what role should I play, and, and how do I go about doing this? Um, when I was in, um, one of the reasons for the title is when I was in podiatry school, and I have a classmate from podiatry school here, Dr. Granoff, and her husband, Charlie. Um, when I was 26 years old, middle of podiatry school, I was diagnosed with cancer, testicular cancer. I joke that I have something in common with Lance Armstrong, no, I didn't date Cheryl Crow. No, I didn't with the Tour de France. No, I didn't uh, do PEDs, but we had the same diagnosis. And so when I first heard that I had cancer, like anybody, I thought I was going to die. It spread to my lungs. And um, I was in Chicago in podiatry school, and my mom kept on calling me. It was the old day when we had the little voicemail, and I kept on hanging up. I would just let it go to voicemail. So one time she left a voicemail, and she said, look, quit hanging up. Um, you, your father's a survivor, I'm a survivor, you'll be a survivor, this is your Auschwitz. So it, that really hit home, that really made an impression that, you know, maybe I can utilize my parents' terrible past, terrible history, but the fact that they overcame incredible odds, I can maybe use that same perseverance to help myself. And I think truly it made it much easier for me to overcome cancer, I graduated in the same class as Sarah. And I think for me, years later, my mom was lecturing at Baylor University School of Medicine, and she would always tell the story about my survival from cancer uh, because she's a guinea pig. We'll talk about what that means. And so I was asked to write an essay, and the title of my essay was A Blessing, Not a Burden. So I've always kind of thought that being a child of Holocaust survivors, yes, has somewhat of a stigma. Um, probably more for some than others, but for me, it's always been a positive. It's really never been a negative. And then really the other reason that for me um, why I do what I'm doing, and I'm still practicing full-time medicine as a podiatrist, but my mom was one of the Mangala twins, and we'll talk about this, but when you go to the doctor, when you go and get your flu shot, you're given the risks, complications, and benefits of getting the, court, the flu shot. Or when we as a podiatrist remove a toenail, we tell the patient, this could happen, that could happen. Well, my mom as a guinea pig at Mangala's lab had no informed consent. So for me, as I was being raised, and when I became a doctor, this kind of this history with my mom being a Mangala twin kind of made me think, I need to make sure my patients understand in whatever terms they need to understand what I'm going to do, what, I, the, what the benefits are, the risks, et cetera. So for me, it kind of takes uh, a different thought as a, Mangala, as a child of a Mangala twin, how that pertains to my daily life as a podiatrist. So I'm here as a child of two Holocaust survivors. The other reason I wrote the book, and even in Indiana, um, throughout the Midwest, maybe throughout the country, a lot of people know my mom's story. But nobody knows, knew my dad's story. And so my dad's story, in my opinion, is as compelling as my mom's. My dad was a four-year survivor. My mom was in the camps for 10, 10 months. And you can never compare pain. I don't mean to suggest that. But even in Terre Haute, where my dad spent most of his life, people didn't know he was a survivor. So I'm going to tell you about my dad's story, then tell you about my mom's story, and then kind of put everything together. So my dad was from Riga, Latvia, one of the Baltic states, um, part of the old Soviet Union. 
And uh, he was one of four boys. The family was very religious. Um, his, in 1941, his oldest brother was in the Latvian Navy. And he was on a ship, and they found out he was Jewish in the Baltic Sea. They killed him and threw him overboard. Around the same time, my dad's father, who I didn't know this when I was going to podiatrist school, but my dad's father, my grandfather, was a shoe cobbler. I'm a podiatrist. And so my grandfather was on his way to work. Restrictions. The Nazis had already occupied Riga. Restrictions were already in effect. He was dressed in very traditional Jewish garb. He was walking on the wrong side of the street. They told him to go to the other side of the street. He, he said no. They killed him. So within a very short period of time, in the fall of 1941, my dad, who at the time was 14 or 15, although he looked much younger for his age, lost his father and his oldest brother. So then they were put in, the family was put into a ghetto, not like the ghetto that we might think about in present-day United States, but this is where they put all the Jews, minimal food, minimal shelter, um, barbed wire. My dad could see his home from the ghetto. I was in Riga this summer for the first time, and I saw my dad's home where he grew up. I saw the ghetto. Um, and so just to give you an idea how my grandmother thought, she wanted her three boys, my dad, who was about 14 or 15, and the two older brothers who were in their early 20s, to have some semblance of normal life. They would celebrate Shabbat dinner. Well, in the ghetto, there's no, there's no dinner table. But my grandmother took the tablecloth from their house and put it on the ground so that when they had Shabbat dinner on the ground, they still had some semblance of being human. That was kind of her mindset. She wanted to preserve as much as she could, thinking maybe hoping against hope this would be a temporary obstacle. And so um, at one point, if you know the uh, movie Unbroken, my dad's second oldest brother, the book and the movie, uh, my dad's second oldest brother uh, was on a work detail, and the Nazi told him, look, you carry this log from here to the end of the field, and when you come back, I kill you. When my uncle came back, he killed the Nazi, escaped, and eventually ended up in the future homeland, future Jewish homeland of Israel. So now my dad is with his mother and brother Leo. Well, now they're going to... Um, essentially do selections. What does that mean? They're going to evacuate the ghetto, but they're going to put men that could work, maybe younger men that could work, and then young children, teenagers that couldn't work, elderly and women in another part of the ghetto. And so my dad, being young, at least looking young, went immediately with his mother to the side of the ghetto where uh, the women elderly would be. My grandmother realized what was going to happen. They were all going to be killed. She pleaded with her son, my dad, and said, no, no, you go with your two brothers. You don't stay here. You go with your two brothers. My dad said, I, my life will be worthless unless I'm with you. No, you go with your two brothers. Well, she went out, obviously. My dad went with Shlomo and Leo into the other side of the ghetto. Uh, on November 30th, 1941, there was a forest, the rumble of forest behind the ghetto. My grandmother was killed there. Um, there was a second day of massacre, no, uh, December 7th, 1941. I believe there were 25 to 30,000 Jews killed in the Rumble of Massacre. That's where my grandmother died. There's a m memorial there. A couple days after the first part of the massacre, my dad went. He could walk around. He went to the site of the massacre, saw a baby doll there. When we were there this summer, I put a baby doll at the site of the memorial. So now... My father's with Brother Leo. Shlomo has escaped. And they're in the ghetto. And then they're in Kaiserwald, which is a concentration camp uh, near Riga. And then he, they get taken to Stutthof, which is a very deadly camp um, near Gdansk, Poland. And the, the, the percentages of people that survived Stutthof was minimal. And then my dad and my uncle Leo get transported down to Germany near Buchenwald in Magdeburg. And now we're April of 45. My dad could tell, my uncle could tell the Nazis were losing the war. My dad would say, you know, he didn't like the Nazis when they were winning the war. Like a wounded animal, sure as heck didn't like the Nazis when they were losing the war. So now they're on a death march. This is April 15th, 1945. And they're on a death march. And... If you step out of line, if you fall, you get shot, you get killed. 
So as they're walking, my dad is thinking to himself, they're going to kill us anyway. I've got to make a run for it. And so we still don't know the conversation that happened between my dad and his brother, my uncle Leo, because Leo ended up surviving. But at some point, they're going around a ravine. It's dusk out. There's a break between the Nazis, and my dad makes a run for it. Years later, when my dad would tell the story, everything my dad would talk about was sports analogies. So at the time, the Indianapolis Colts football team had a running back named Edger and James. So when he would lecture to kids, he'd say he ran like Edger and James trying to dodge the bullets. He then hid in the building. They're shooting at him. They don't send uh, uh, dogs after him. The rumor was in this area that the Americans were coming through to liberate. And so my dad's hiding, hoping that A is not going to get caught by the Nazis. But now there's fierce fighting. And so he's hiding, hiding. This goes on for several hours. And then for about the next two hours, there's silence. And my dad was very good with languages. And he hears a weird language after the two hours of silence. He knows it's not Hebrew, not German, not Latvian. Maybe it's the Americans. So he comes up with his hands up, and it's American GIs, and they give him a Coca-Cola. True story. When I was a little kid, I never knew what Pepsi was. We had Coca-Cola breakfast, lunch, and dinner. My dad's dying last several days. He had always four or five Coca-Cola in his room. Where's my Coca-Cola? I go, Dad, there's four of them here. So they gave him a Coca-Cola, and um, they asked him, how does it feel to be free? He knew the word free, and he said, good. He had lice all over him. His clothes were in shreds. And the GIs um, were afraid that their officers would think of my dad as a liability. The officer of this unit, 250th Battalion, their main mission was to build bridges with some guy by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Neff. Well, Mr. Neff was from a place called Tarot, Indiana. For three or four days, um, the GIs hid my dad from Mr. Neff, fearing that Mr. Neff would say, well, he's going to be a liability. We're going to encounter some combat. What do we do when we're in combat? And so finally, Mr. Neff finds out about my dad and kind of interviews him. My dad knew languages, knew the terrain, knew the area. And they said, no, 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 we're not going to put him in refugee camp. We're going to put him in GI clothes. So my dad all of a sudden becomes an honorary member. They call him the mascot or DP uh, of this unit. And for several weeks, he traveled with them. He sat on the Jeep with Mr. Neff. And they, my dad slowly became, again, he was very good with languages. And so he slowly learned English. And so now it's late April, early May. And let me go back. I always forget this part. My dad was liberated April 15th, 1945. My birthday is April 15th, several years later. Ironically, I didn't know the story until I did more research with the book. I knew he was liberated in April. So now it's early May, and they're about to near combat. So Mr. Neff says, Mickey, you know, you're going to have to, you don't know how to use a gun. We're going to unfortunately have to put you in a refugee camp. And so my dad looks at Mr. Neff and says, Mr. Neff, Lieutenant Colonel Neff, I want to go where you're from, which he didn't know where Terre Haute, Indiana was, but he knew it was America. And so shortly thereafterwards, the war is over. My dad's in the refugee camp. Mr. Neff is somewhere in Western Europe now. My dad writes a letter from the refugee camp. This is not the letter to Mr. Neff, somebody in Great Britain doesn't know where Mr. Neff is, but they know Mrs. Neff is in Terre Haute. She reads a telegram. The telegram says, I want to go where you're from. So Mr. Neff contacts the GIs that helped liberate my dad. They find my dad in the refugee camp. And next thing you know, my dad's traveling with these G GIs, post-war occupation, helping out as if he's a soldier. He's in Vienna. This is a letter. If you look closely, it's hard to see. That's a Coca-Cola malt. Again, he loved Coca-Cola. Um, then the following, and th this went on for over a year. This is in March of 46. This is a letter to Mr. Neff. Mr. Neff in Terre Haute, Indiana, wants to make sure that my dad can read, write, and speak English so he can get into high school. His four years of high school, age 15 and 19, were his four years of concentration camp. So Mr. Neff finds out that the Vigo County School Corporation will accept my father. And so um, on May 11th, 1946, 
My dad boards the SS Marine Flasher. It's a boat out of Germany with about seven or 800 survivors. Um, ends up in New York. My dad takes a train to this place called Terre Haute, Indiana. By the time he got to Terre Haute, he found out that Leo had survived and was living in West Hartford, Connecticut, not far from here. I have a cousin there. Uh, he couldn't make it because his wife's sick. And that uh, Shlomo was in, in Tel Aviv, Israel. And so my dad's going to go to high school. And my dad was very smart. Three years of high school, he turned into one year of high school. He tested out of classes and did very well. Well, as a kid in Riga, any sports fans here, basketball fans? Good. So in Riga, my father liked to play soccer. Well, in 1946, here at Bristol Community College or in Boston, there's not a lot of soccer going on, but there's a lot of basketball. Well, as we all know, basketball was invented in the state of Indiana. And yes, I know we just beat the Celtics last night. But so my dad's in high school. And my dad, on a good day, is like five foot two on a good day. And so he finds out, he goes through high school one year. He's going to be a pharmacist because the family he's living with, which is next door to the Neff family, owns a pharmacy. So he wants to be a pharmacist. So he enrolls at Indiana State Teachers College, which is now Indiana State University in Terre Haute. And he finds out he's got to take the gym class, but the gym class, he finds out, is being taught by the basketball coach. Oh, he's great. I'm going to learn how to play basketball because everybody in Terre Haute, all they do is talk about basketball. And so he enrolls in, that's Terre Haute, he enrolls in the college, goes to the basketball, first day of class. The coach is some guy by the name of John Wooden. <laughs> so... Coach Wooden was from South Bend, Indiana, was an All-American at Purdue. This is his first college coaching job. So my dad, again, on a good day, five foot two, halfway through the semester, you know, we didn't study, nobody studied gym class. My dad studied because he got to get an A. So Coach Wooden took my dad aside halfway through the semester and said, Mickey, you're going to get an A, but you're such a good influence on these kids. I need you to take the class next semester. You'll get an A then, too. But I just, you're such a good influence. You study. You, the kids look up to you. You're a little older than them, because he was like 21 now. And so they become good friends. And the next year, Coach Wooden goes to UCLA. My dad goes to Purdue Pharmacy School. And years later, when I'm a little kid, we're watching college basketball. My dad says, oh, there's my gym teacher. So Coach Wooden starts sending us letters. I have most of the letters. Dear Mickey, I hope your family's doing good. I have this new player. His name's Lou Alcindor. I hope he's really good, which now for some of you, that's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And so um, in 1997, most of you have heard of Larry Bird. Um, Coach Wooden and Larry Bird were honored at Indiana State. My mom took this picture, and Co they hadn't seen each other in about 50 years. And I think Coach Wooden died a couple years after that. And so... That's kind of my dad's story, which nobody knows about. And now we're going to talk a little bit about my mom's story, which maybe some of you do know about. So my mom and my dad did not know each other during the war. My mom is from the Transylvanian Valley, Hungary, Romania. Um, my mom had two older sisters. Her father, Alexander, who I'm named after, was very, very religious. So now they have a third pregnancy. He's hoping against hope to have a boy. So the midwife, there's obviously no ultrasound. The midwife comes to deliver. Out comes a girl. They said, Miriam. Oh, but don't wait. Don't fear. There's another one coming. So with great disappointment, my mom entered into the world. So now they're identical twins. And so my mom was always treated by her fathers kind of as the black sheep of the family. When the girls got in trouble, my mom would be always the one punished. Um, my mom can remember a variety of things that happened in this time of, again, this is 1939 when she's five years old, 1940, six years old. Life for them was pretty normal. Whereas my dad by now, by 41, the Nazis are already occupied. If you know history, Hungary, Romania was supposed to be saved from the Nazis. So my mom can remember being on her horse, horse and buggy carriage and their mother said, don't go up to that castle. Castles are dangerous here. Well, if you remember, I said Transylvania. There was supposedly somebody in one of these castles named Count Dracula. My mom was not in the direct area where Count Dracula's castle was, but she always was very fearful of going to any castles. And then obviously years later, she heard all the stories about Dracula. The other thing she remembers 
is about the same time, one day the girls were put in a room and told to play with their dolls or toys, and their parents were listening to somebody on the radio. So my mom, always being kind of the troublemaker, mischievous, puts her ear to the door and hears somebody screaming in German in the radio. Obviously, it was Hitler. So my mom, at the age of five or six, could sense something bad was about to happen. She would tell her dad, Daddy, we need to leave. And her father said, you don't know anything. You're just a child. Around the same time, my grandfather, my mom's father, took a trip to the future Jewish homeland, Palestine, to see if things got bad in Hungary, Romania, would it be worthwhile to leave Europe? And so he and his brother, Alexander and his brother, went there. They came back. He was very excited. But my grandmother said, well, how can we travel with the two little girls? My mom always resented her parents because they didn't keep her safe. And so shortly around 42, 43, things got bad. We were talking, somebody was talking about math earlier. Um, her teacher in school all of a sudden becomes a Nazi teacher. They have math equations when they're seven years old. If you have five Jews and you till, kill two Jews, how many Jews does that leave? They would go home. My mom and my aunt would go home and say, Mommy, how come we have to take this? We're Jewish. How come? Oh, the mother said, my grandmother said, well, you just have to take it because we're Jewish. The picture on the right is the last family picture. My mom, for whatever reason, is always, 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 almost every picture is on the left. And this is a baby picture, obviously. She's on the left. The family picture, the tall man in the middle in the back is my grandfather. The two older girls are the two older sisters. There's a family friend, a cousin, and then my grandmother on the bottom with the two twins, my mom to the left, my aunt to the right. And so, 43, things did get worse. And then in February of 44, they realize that things are really bad. At one point in the middle of the night, they go to the edge that they're going to escape because the border's close. A Nazi youth says, stop. If you take one more step, we'll shoot. So they, it was too late. Their window of opportunity had closed. So in March, April of 44, like my dad, they're put in a ghetto. Her family friend that was in the picture before would throw food across the barbed wire. She was not Jewish. Her father was a, a minister, a pastor, reverend. Um, and so the friend would give them food. And then the ghetto was evacuated. And so they're put on a cattle car. A lot of people will ask me, well, did they know where they were going? No, they had no idea where they were going. Each cattle car had about 100 people. The bathroom was in the corner. Uh, there was a little peephole that every couple, six, seven hours, the cattle car would stop to be refueled. Through the, cat, through the little peephole, my grandfather was in charge of his cattle car. They would get water for gold watches. So finally, after three days, over 80 hours on the cattle car, the cattle car is now slowing down. They realized that, and on the last stop, I should also mention that the exchange language was no longer Hungarian, it was German, and they feared that this was bad. So sure enough, the cattle car opens up to this mass chaos. This is a selection platform at Auschwitz. This is a selection platform when my mom saw, last saw her, her mother, her dad, her two older sisters. When the cattle car opened, the last thing my mom remembers is her father disappearing into the crowd. There's dogs barking, there's smoke, there's crying, chaos. Her two sisters disappear in the crowd. Now it's my mom and my aunt holding on to their mother on the cattle car. They're always dressed alike. Somebody's running up and down the selection platform yelling, twins, twins, a, a Nazi. They see my mom and my aunt. They ask my grandmother, are they twins? Before she says yes, Three Nazis jump out, separate my mom from their mother and my aunt from her, uh, the, my grandmother. If my mom were here today, she would tell you the one regret she has is that she didn't know this would be the last time she would see her mother. She didn't get a chance to say goodbye. So their mom is dragged away crying and screaming. Now the two twins are just looking around, not knowing what to do, what would happen next. They're then taken to a barracks where they're tattooed. My aunt's number is A7064. My mom's number is A7063. For years and years and years, as I was growing up, when we would go to Israel, my aunt's number was written like a fine tip pen. My mom's number was always like smudged. And I just thought it was because she was old, even though she was like 30. 
And so once maybe in the 80s, when we were in Israel, my mom said, Miriam, how come your number's so clear? And they were starting to put together the history. They were starting to remember things. And as my sister and I were getting older, she had more time. She was now a real estate agent, my mom was. And Miriam says, well, you don't remember when they tattooed you, it took five Nazis to hold you down. You were kicking and biting you, creating mass chaos. And my mom, who liked to joke, which you'll hear, um, my mom said, well, I must have blocked it out because I was raised to be a good Jewish girl, and good Jewish girls don't bite. <laughs> and so that was the first day. They then get taken to a barracks. It's all female twins, ages 3 to 13. And my mom and my aunt were raised kosher. Food comes, it basically looks like mud. And my mom tells one of the older twins, well, I'm not eating until I see my mother. Well, the older twin says, well, look, you, you, you know, this whole thought about being kosher, you might as well forget about that. And you see that smoke there? Those are your parents. And my mom says, oh, that's crazy. Who's going to be burning bodies? And so the older twin says, well, just wait. Tomorrow you're going to meet Dr. Mangala. Dr. Mangala came in the next morning, all the little twins, 3 to 13, stood at tension like little toy soldiers. If you remember Hogan's Heroes, they were in little lines. And so he was inspecting his new arrivals, of which my mom and my aunt were two of them. And they were part of experimentation, medical experiments. There were approximately 1,500 sets, 3,000 twins, ages 3 to 13, boys and girls. The girls were on one side of the camp, boys were on the other. And in a very short period of time, this is now May of 44, my mom was part of the experiments. They would lie on tables naked. Can you imagine age 10 years old naked with boys and girls? Things injected, blood drawn. This would go on for hours. Nobody told them, and this is important, nobody told them you know, what they were injected with. Nobody said, you can do this or you can't. A lot of people, even now, will debate um, what, what the purpose was the, of the experiments. One thing I told you earlier, with my father, any of the young children was sent immediately to the gas chamber. The only reason my mom was not sent to the gas chamber, the only reason, because she was a twin. If she had not been a twin, I wouldn't be here. So um, people debate what the purpose of the experiments what is, was. This is data from Auschwitz. You look down. You can see Moses, Miriam Moses, Eva Moses. That's my mom and my aunt. We have all kind of data, uh, blood drawn, when blood was drawn. But um, over the years later, my mom was always, and we'll talk about this, was trying to figure out what was injected. So if you talk to any of the twins, their one thought was that they were being used for medical experimentation to perpetuate the German race, meaning, i.e., develop fertility drugs. If you talk to experts now, there's a book by David Marlowe um, that's been out four or five years. I believe that's his last name. He disputes that and says, no, that was not the purpose of the experiments. Uh, nonetheless, as I said earlier, this was all done without their informed consent. Um, we just answered that. So a couple of things, little anecdotal stories. So they got into the routine from May, June, July of these experiments. One day in August, as my dad also realized, my mom could sense that the Nazis, were, their morale was down. So one day they look, and there's no guards in the guard towers. And then she looks up and sees a plane circling Auschwitz. This is roughly August of 44. On the back of the plane, she sees an American flag. When I heard this story in my 20s, I go, wait a second. Because I was always doubting. I was always skeptical. I said, how would you know? You're age 10, 11. How would you know there's an American flag? There's no TV. There's no internet. She goes, Alex, my dear, we had a cousin, an aunt in Cleveland, Ohio. She was a mischievous one. So when she was little, when the mail would come, she would always open the envelopes. The envelope from Cleveland, Ohio had the American stamp. And my mom looked at the plane and put two and two together. That must be an American plane. My mom would tell you also, from the second that she landed on the selection platform, she could no longer think like a 10-year-old. Every day was a day of luck and courage. Any time somebody could kill you. So she had to think every day, how could she survive? Um, and so she could no longer think like a 10-year-old. She had to think like an adult. So she looks up at the plane, sees the 
American flag. It was a reconnaissance mission, so they would not bomb within Auschwitz. Years later, when she was lecturing, she met one of the pilots on the plane. Another anecdotal story, around November, December of 44, they could even tell more that the Nazis were losing. One day, there's no Nazis around. So my mom and two other twins went from their barracks to the kitchen to organize food. In camp language, organize meant steal, because they didn't like to the word use steal. Organize food. So they put potatoes in their dress, turn around and hear a Jeep, two Nazis jump out, machine guns. The last thing my mom remembers is a rifle pointing at her head. She faints. They think they kill her. She wakes up. She thinks she's in heaven. Because the last thing she remembers, she touches the two girls ice cold. So she quick realized they thought they'd killed her. She fainted. My mom would always tell you that she had an angel, a guardian angel looking after her. The two other girls, unfortunately, were dead. So she had the terrible task to go back to the barracks and tell their twins that those two girls had died. So within a couple hours, the twins were hiding in this barracks. Those same two Nazis found them and took them on a death march from Auschwitz II, which is Birkenau, to Auschwitz I. It's about five, five kilometers, 3.1 miles. Um, five kilometers, three point, yeah. And so when they got to Auschwitz I, Nazis disappeared. The girls run into a barracks. Now it's winter. Winter in Poland is really cold, probably colder than it is here in Massachusetts. And so in January, there are no Nazis around. Um, I can tell a story that behind Auschwitz I, there's a river, the Vistula River. So my mom was pretty brave, and they needed water to boil. So she went to the river, hit the ice, and she looked up. And across the river, she sees a girl her age with braided hair on her way to school, dressed up like a normal girl. That girl looked at my mom. My mom looked at her. And that was my mom's first recollection, this is January 45, that the whole world was not a concentration camp. And that was something she always remembered. Came back, boiled the water, they had potatoes or eggs, or I think it was potatoes. So one day it's snowing sideways. They're in the second floor of block 24. Ron, you'll see all this when you go in January. Um, and so, one day on January 27th, 1945, they see snowing and then see something moving. It's the Ukrainian army. If you know history, the, the Soviets liberated Auschwitz. Um, and this picture, that's my mom and my aunt, the front of the line, my mom on the left. So this is from a video from the Russians. This is always known as a liberation picture. So it's from a video. It's not January 27th, 45. What happened was, on that day, the Russians gave all the twins candy and cookies and milk. They danced with them, and they said, we're coming back, because they wanted to come back with big motion pictures for propaganda. So my mom would tell you, it was a couple of days later, she would argue with the Auschwitz tour guides. The Auschwitz tour guides were defiant. No, Eva, it was late February, early March. They came back with these big motion picture cameras. My mom, to her dying day, loved attention, not afraid to say it. I've seen the video of this. When this video started, my mom was in the middle. I think she saw the camera at the end of the runway here and ran to the front, so she would be in the front. They ran this video over. On the fifth time, like any 10-year-old kid, she sticks out her tongue at the camera. <laughs> so that was January 27th or late February. But the question is now, my mom and my aunt, they thought, well, they were 10 years old. Their birthday was four days later, the 31st of January. Um, surely they, if they survived, their parents had to survive. So they were hoping against hope that they would survive. If you see the two girls right behind my mom with the white, those were the Changara twins. They're the only twins still alive, of all the Mangala twins as a set, only ones. They live in Israel. I'm friends with their granddaughter. And so their mother was good friends with my grandmother. And so my mom and my aunt are there, then go to Katowice. They're in an orphanage. Eight months later, Mrs. Changara, the mother of those two twins, goes to the orphanage, which we go to every year, and lies and says she's an aunt, writes them out so that they can leave. So they end up back at their home. 
hoping against hope that their parents survived. The only thing that survived was a family dog. My mom would tell you that the Nazis killed people but didn't kill dogs. So they found the picture I showed you, the last picture on the floor, so my mom grabbed that. They found out that an aunt was living in Cluj, which was a neighboring city, larger city. They went to live with the aunt, and my mom you know, wanted affection. The nuns were very nice at the orphanage, but they didn't give kisses, they didn't give hugs, they had clean sheets. The aunt had clean sheets, but my mom would say, can't you give us a hug? The aunt had lost um, a husband and a son during the war. No, I don't give hugs. I don't give hugs. So finally, in 1950, my mom and my aunt, uh, with their aunt, go to Israel. Um, if you've seen the movie about my mom, Eva Ada 7063, um, they kind of portray where she f first went in to the uh, Haifa port. But that was the first time when she got to Israel that she really felt like she no longer had nightmares. She felt free. She would go to the store. The, the store owner was Jewish. The teacher was Jewish. Everybody was Jewish. So all the nightmares that she had for the last several years were gone. And so they were in the Israeli army. Um, they liked to date. And so before the army, I, they were in a kibbutz. And all the people, kids in the kibbutz, were all teenagers, all Holocaust survivors. So I said, how was it living in a kibbutz, mom? She goes, well, Alex, I learned how to say I love you in 10 languages. So that answered that question. And so my mom was an architect, a draftswoman. My aunt was a nurse. And they would never tell as they got older, this is a picture on the right in their 20s, early 20s, they would never tell the guy they were dating that they had a twin. So one time, my mom was dating this guy. She didn't like him, so she invited to their apartment to listen to music. So when he came to the door, my aunt answered the door. They were identical. He couldn't tell the difference. So he sat down. They put on the rec some kind of you know, record. We didn't have uh, you know, eight tracks or cassettes. They listen to the music, and he tries to kiss my aunt, thinking it's my mom. My mom jumps out of the closet. He's never been seen since. He runs and runs. True story. So my aunt marries a Sabra, a native Israeli. My mom was dating a guy, and she was heartbroken because his family said, I want my in-laws, I want my future uh, daughter-in-law to have a big family. Well, my mom lost 119 family members in the Holocaust. She had no family. She had one sister. So the mother of the boy she was dating broke it off. So now we start putting pieces together. My dad now has finished Purdue Pharmacy School, is now a pharmacist, becomes a big Purdue fan, but he goes to visit Shlomo, the one that killed the Nazi. So um, Shlomo puts an ad in his newspaper. He's uh, an editor for Mahari, which is a, still a popular Israeli newspaper. There was no internet dating in 1960, and so that was supposed to be a joke. And so, uh, so my mom knows no English. My dad's Hebrew is worse. And so they go out on several dates. On the third date, my dad asks my mom a question. She says yes. He pulls out a ring, and they're engaged. And so they had a ceremony. If you know Israel, one of the famous streets is Dizengoff. They had a ceremony on Dizengoff Street at a synagogue. My mom was still in the Israeli army. My dad had to come back to Terre Haute to work as a pharmacist. So it took several months before my mom could get out of the army. And so she flies to New York. Funny story. Um, so she's met at the airport, Kennedy Airport, by Leo, the one that my dad's brother and his wife, he know no, no, he, no Hebrew. And she's met at the airport by her cousin from Israel who lives in New York. So Leo's wife, Ruth, puts a corsage on my mom's lapel. In Israel, women don't wear corsages. So my mom in Hebrew tells her cousin, what is this stupid flower on my jacket? I want to take it off. And the cousin says, no, 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 no. You'll insult your future in-laws. Just when you get to the restaurant, say you're hot. Get to the restaurant. She says, hot, hot, takes off the jacket. Everybody orders steak. My mom wanted to sound very debonair. So when everybody ordered well, she said, well, well. So when the steak came out, it was like a brick. Couldn't cut it. They get to West Hartford, where my Uncle Leo lived, and they call my dad. And again, with dictionaries, my dad says, Eva, my friends, their wives want to throw you shower. My mom looks in her dictionary, think maybe it's a mikvah. And she says, Mickey, 
Tell your friends, thank you very much. I take shower alone. That was my mom's first day in the United States. So two years later or so, I'm born. I have a sister. And, you know, my first language in Terre Haute was not English. It was Hebrew because my mom didn't speak any English. And we'll talk about that when we have our special guest. Um, and so, you know, we went to St. Louis. We played tennis. Um, and so it was a relatively normal life. Except, you know, I knew my mom had a number. And we were told very age-appropriate information. To give you an example, I was seven years old. My sister's two years younger. And um, my sister's best friend lives next door, not Jewish. So she, my sister's next door playing with Jill Baker. And Mrs. Baker is a professor at local college. So when, we, when, when my mom would do the dishes, we would see my mom's number. So Mrs. Baker's doing the dishes. My sister's on the left side of Mrs. Baker. Very innocently, five-year-old girl. Mrs. Baker, how come you don't have a number like my mommy does? Well, Mrs. Baker's not a Holocaust survivor, not Jewish. Mrs. Baker, very smart, says, well, Rena, you need to go ask your mom that. OK, houses are very close together. Mommy, mommy, I'm at Jill's house, and I don't understand. How come Mrs. Baker doesn't have a number like you do? Miss, my mom. I think a lot of parents would say, you're too young to know. We'll tell you later. My mom didn't hesitate. She said, Rena, remember, your father and I told you, you and your brother that bad people did bad, bad, bad things to us. And those bad people didn't do bad things to Mrs. Baker because she wasn't part of those experiences. Oh, and that's why she doesn't have a number like you do. Right. So my sister at the age of five knew very basic information that our parents were a little different. And so, you know, by the time I was 12, 13, 14, I knew all these stories. I was bored with them. I even recall, and I'll tell you why in a second, I even told my mom, why can't she be like the other moms? It was very embarrassing. The thing that kind of defined our family right around this time of year, Halloween, at least the custom in Terre Haute, was kids would throw corn at the house. I was in fifth grade, and they would run to the next house. Well, when this happened in our house, my mom immediately had images of what happened to her as a child. Her father did nothing. So she, the next day, would stand behind the tree in front of the house and start chasing these kids around the house. It seemed like a benign act. The next day, more kids showed up. And then three days later, I remember coming home from a PTA meeting. I never heard this word on our, on our front door, front uh, window, go home dirty Jew with a swastika. 1972, I, had, I didn't know what a dirty Jew was. And so my mom, my dad, you know, they were infuriated. My mom was mad. She would call the kids, all my contemporaries, my classmates, call their parents. None of them were Jewish. Nobody knew about the Holocaust. Well, Eric, Mike, your, your, uh, um, your kids are creating havoc. Oh, Eva, they're just having fun. Let them have fun. Well, they're having fun on my account. Parents didn't understand it. Uh, my mom, the, when I was in fifth grade, gave a lecture to think, well, maybe that didn't work. She was not a very polished speaker. So finally, a couple years later, my dad started making a little bit more money. We moved to a nicer area. And then my mom got the bright idea that every October, flights to Israel were cheap. I'll get to this in a second. Flight to Israel were cheap. And so she would go for the whole month of October to Israel to see her twin and other relatives. They would throw a corner at the house. My dad would turn off the light and just take a nap. And the fun quickly died out. So another significant thing happened. I was 16, 17. If you all remember the movie Roots, a miniseries, about a year or two later, Holocaust um, was 1978. And um, it was a three or four part series on NBC. My mom called the local NBC affiliate and uh, said, found out, is this a documentary? Is this a movie? And they said, well, it's a movie. Why are you asking? And my mom wasn't very well known. And she said, well, I survived that place. What do you mean you survived? Well, I'm an Auschwitz survivor. I'm a Mangala twin. So they invited us the last night of the show, my sister and my dad and me and my mom, to the studio. And then after the last segment, my mom would appear on the local news. The very last part of the movie, if you know the movie, uh, after liberation, there's a little 15-year-old boy kicking a soccer ball. My dad, I look over, I never see my dad cry, crying hysterically. Why would he be crying? Well, I put two and two together. He saw himself 
obviously in the movie, thinking that was him and could relate. My mom, with her emotions in check, then went on the news, did a great job. And so for me, I quickly realized what I needed to do was kind of help my dad come to terms with his past and at the same time encourage my mom to speak. And she spoke. And she spoke. And so um, my dad kind of continued as a pharmacist, loving sports and music. He loved playing the piano. It was very, very... He, both my parents, and you can understand it, really embraced being Americans. Uh, my mom became somewhat of an activist. The Head Start program, which was at the local African-American community center, she helped start. Um, 1968, I remember vividly, um, when uh, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated, my parents were big, big Kennedy supporters. I had met Mr. Kennedy as a six-year-old a month earlier um, at a, a women's uh, meeting my mom was involved in. And so in 1984, my mom started Candles. She knew of another twin besides our aunt. They found other twins. They located 122 twins in seven or eight countries around the world. Because when my mom went to the local library, after that experience, when I was in fifth or sixth grade, she went to look up Mangala twins. There was no information about Mangala twins. So she thought she needed to pull all these resources and find out what happened to the other twins. So that led to the following year, the 40th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, 1985. The weird thing for me was, and I had never been there, and I didn't have one textbook on the, ho on the, on the Holocaust. My textbook were my parents. And so, but I knew where everything was. I knew where my mom's barracks was, and I was kind of in charge of the logistics. We had about 10 to 12 Mengele twins with us. The following week, we had a mock trial of Mengele. At the time, he was thought to be still alive. We had a mock trial of Mengele at, um, um, in Israel. And so, you know, I've been to Israel, I'm sorry, I've been to Auschwitz, this January will be my 30th time. So my mom became more active. She was trying to help other Mengele twins because many of them now were in their 50s, um, starting to have health problems. So for Yom HaShoah, um, my mom was in the Capitol Rotunda and held up a sign very innocently Mangala twins support House of Representatives with reparations money for all the Mangala twins. She was doing this on their behalf. The officer to the left, David Wells, was his first day on the job. He approached my mom and said, where's your permit? She didn't have a permit. She rolls up her sleeve and says, there's my permit. His commanding officer on the right didn't think it was so funny, so they pulled her. If you see the movie Eva A-7063, Ted Green found the original video, and the screens by mom and my mom are haunting. Um, they take her downstairs. Two weeks ago, I was in Baltimore, and David Wells, who has become a friend, came to the event, and I had dinner with him. When, he took, when they took my mom downstairs, I had every intention of sending her to jail. David looked at her number and said, no, 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 we, she's an Auschwitz survivor. He convinced on his first day to his superior, he said, no, no, let's give her just a warning. My mom was so shook up, she kept on crying. His name's David. He's not Jewish. He, had a, he wears a star of David. It was given to him by a family relative since he was a little boy. So my mom's crying hysterically. Finally, he takes out the star of David, and she calms down. So she came back to Indiana thinking that, you know, everybody's against her, a little bit of paranoia, and thinking, okay, this is bad. Well, things get worse, and one of the things that my mom would teach me and teach you is that as bad as things are in the world, you got to pull yourself off the mat and do something to benefit yourself or society. So unfortunately, um, June of 1993, my mom's twin, uh, my aunt, dies, I need to take a step back. 1987, uh, when I had cancer, several months later, my aunt was going into um, kidney failure, so my mom flew to Israel, donated her kidney. When they took the kidney out of my aunt's body in 1987, it had not developed beyond the age of 10 when the experiments were done. So my mom uh, would tell you she lost not only her sister, but a kidney. And so my cousins in Israel were very religious. They didn't wait for her to come, so she never had buried a family member. The picture on the right is several months, maybe a year later. 
And so she was, I don't know that she was depressed, but she was looking for focus. What does she do now? And as I told you, one of the lessons, no matter how bad things are, she would figure out a way to kind of regain focus. Three months later, she, and this is an important part, so if you remember anything, I'd like you to remember this part. We're heading toward the finish line. Um, so four months later, fall of, uh, of 93, my mom gets a phone call from a Dr. John Mahalchik from Boston University School of Medicine, and he says, Eva, I know you like to lecture. Would you want to come to Boston to lecture to a bunch of doctors? And my mom said, oh, I love lecturing to doctors. And then he says something strange. He said, well, maybe you could find one of those Nazi doctors. Maybe you could bring him, too. And my mom would like to joke, even when maybe it wasn't the most appropriate. And she says, well, Dr. Mahalchik, where do you think I can find one of those dudes? The last time I looked, they were not advertising in the Yellow Pages. For young people, Yellow Pages are the big, thick things of phone books. <laughs> so he said, oh, Eva, that's funny. But you'll think of something. The last project that my mom and my aunt worked on before my aunt died was for ZDF, a German TV network. The last, when the movie was done, at the end of the movie, there's a Nazi doctor named Hans Munch that was cleared of all charges that helped save 20-some Jewish doctors at Auschwitz, worked alongside Mengele. He went back to Germany to practice medicine. So my mom thought, I'll contact ZDF. So she contacts ZDF. Maybe he'll come to Boston. The response was... Good news and bad news. The good news is he's going to give you an interview. The bad news is he's not coming to Boston. You've got to go to Germany. My mom had not been really to Germany since 1945. On the flight over, she's on Lufthansa. Here's instructions in German. She freaks out. So Dutch TV um, filmed it. She gets to Dr. Munch's house. Very, very nervous. Very scared, in fact. I wasn't there. And so she was having back problems, so she sits down, and Dr. Munch gets her a pillow and gets her a blanket, gets her a, a water, and my mom says, boy, Dr. Munch, you're not like the other guys, the other doctors I remember. Then he asked her, the, then she asked him the big question, do you know, because what her thought was, maybe she would, he would know, Dr. Munch would know what the experiments were, maybe then that could help the surviving Mangala twins avoid the same predicament as my Aunt Miriam. With great disappointment, Dr. Munch said, Eva, Mengele kept everything to himself. He worked, you know, in the same area, but he didn't tell us anything. And then he said, but I have nightmares. My mom said, wait a second, you have nightmares? Well, what are your nightmares about? He went on to describe, not only did he help 17, 17 to 20 Jewish doctors, one of his other duties was that um, periodically, he would sit outside the gas chamber. And when the body stopped moving, he would sign one death certificate. He went on to describe the operation of the gas chamber. My mom was always a quick thinker, much quicker than me. And she said, well, Dr. Munch, this information is unbelievable. The world needs to know. For all the revisionists in 1993, let alone now, your information is a Nazi doctrine. The world needs to know this. And so my mom thought, Dr. Munch, in 1995, the 50th anniversary, we're going to Auschwitz. Would you say those exact words at the ruins of a gas chamber at Auschwitz? Without hesitating, he said, of course. So my mom came back to Terre Haute, and I said, how did it go? And she said, well, he didn't know anything, but he's coming with us to Auschwitz in 1995. I go, what? No, no, you don't want to do that. No, I don't care what you think. He's going to document that there was a Holocaust. But now I need to figure out a way to thank him. So my mom went to the local Hallmark store in Terre Haute for two and a half hours looking for a thank you card for a Nazi doctor. Eva, what are you looking for? Didn't really, she didn't want to say. She went to the liquor store. My parents didn't drink alcohol much. Nothing seemed appropriate. So for months, my mom would think, how can I think? I want to thank him. I want to thank him. Then one day, she thought, her as a little mangled twin who was just scraping to survive, the best thing she could do to honor Dr. Munch was to thank him in her name only. And that's very, very important, in her name only. She wanted to thank him for documenting the Holocaust. And by doing that, she was going to forgive him for being a Nazi. So she went to her local professor. My mom graduated from Indiana State University in 1990. Took her 11 years because she was working. So she went to her professor because she was always worried that her grammar would be bad and that somebody would see the document years later. 
So Dr. Kaufman said, well, Eva, your grammar is fine, but you're forgiving the wrong guy. And my mom said, no, no, I want to, I'm thanking Dr. Munch for, and as a result, I want to forgive him. Well, you need to think about it, but I think you're, th you're, th you're, th you're forgiving the wrong guy. So January 27th, 1995, my mom, this is Dr. Munch on the way to the ceremony. It was me, my sister, Dr. Munch's son and daughter, granddaughter, and a lot of other Mangala twins who were not happy with my mom. And my mom allowed Dr. Munch to talk. He did show remorse. There was no deal between my mom. He knew nothing about my mom's forgiveness, knew nothing. So then my mom made her statement, says to thank you, I want to forgive you, and I'm doing this in my name only. And I remember a reporter from Bulgaria asking, well, Eva, you're forgiving Dr. Munch. What about Dr. Mangala? My mom said, no, no, I just want to forgive Dr. Munch. Well, after the ceremony, over the next several months, she started realizing that she no longer had this chip on her shoulder. She could hear German. She felt comfortable. She smiled more. She laughed more. So she thought, you know, this anger that was feeding her was only making her health worse. So she decided to forgive Dr. Mangala, forgive her mom, forgive her dad, forgive herself for hating her, her parents, resenting her parents. So gradually over a period of time, by the summer of 95, she decided to forgive pretty much everybody. So just a couple of things here, and then I might need Stephen's help. Um, open up at Candles Holocaust Museum, which is still in existence. My dad has, was retiring from being a pharmacist, so he reluctantly worked there one day a week. My mom would go to Auschwitz. Um, this number, like I said, is probably 30 now. My mom, so back then when this was taken, my mom was on Twitter. She has 33,000 followers. Back then, I was still single, still Jewish, still looking. Today, I'm still single, still Jewish, still looking. So this was her way of advertising to see if she could find me a girlfriend. Didn't really work, but um, so she had a good sense of humor. She didn't drink alcohol. The, the picture on the top left is just kind of a joke. So she had some interesting friends. How many of you know the rock group Motley Crue? So I'll tell you this story here. Ron, we're doing okay on time? A little bit. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make this short. So my mom was a Grand Marshal Indy 500, night 2017. We're on the red carpet. Out pops this guy. When my mom lectured to kids, particularly kids, she would say, you know, I too am prejudiced. I think all guys with tattoos, long hair, torn jeans, um, are all drug addicts. And so she was lecturing at a high school, and she sees these three boys walking in front of her. Their pants were cleaning the floor, she said. And one of them had the audacity to bend over and pick up a pencil. My mom said, I saw things I've never seen before in my life. So she tells the teacher, oh, those three kids, they must be the drug addicts. And they said, no, Eva, they're a valedictorians. And so my mom would tell kids, I too need to not look at the way, not judge people on the way they look. I need to judge them on their character. So we're on the red carpet. This guy pops out, earrings, tattoos, everything. Hey, baby, let's take a picture. I'm looking at him. I think, I know him. He's got sunglasses. So Jake Gyllenhaal's, the actor's right behind us. All the cameras are now on my mom and this guy. Everybody's taking pictures. Two hours later on the Indie Star website, Says, only at the Indy 500 would you have Holocaust survivor Eva Kaur and Motley Crue's Nikki Six. So my mom tweeted him two hours later, Dear Mr. Six, how can I be a rock star like you? He tweets back, Eva, my dear, you've been a rock star your whole life. Real quick, so a couple months later, my mom was talking to Nikki all the time. I said, Mom, how's your shoulder doing? She goes, Oh, Alex, my shoulder's so much better. Nikki's been given the CBD oil, it works great. <laughs> <laughs> So just a couple other things, life lessons. My dad's life lessons are pretty straightforward. Be honest, be hard work, be humble, be tough. My mom's are a little bit maybe more worldly. Um, thanks, Steve. And so uh, the big thing on number four, number four, is as I said earlier, when she, after she got to her aunt's house in Cluj, she didn't get any hugs. So she would tell you, for all the kids that didn't have their parents, when you go home, give your child an extra hug, and then for your parents and grandparents, give your kids an extra So in downtown Indianapolis, there's a big mural of my mom right by the Pacers Arena. So for me, I do think I have an obligation to tell my parents past, and I obviously wear a lot of different hats. 
So I would ask when you go home to your community, you know, remember my parents, remember other Holocaust survivors as well, and remember their life lessons. At the very end of the movie, Eva A-7063, this is where I usually cry, um, my mom looks up at the heavens at the selection platform and tells her mom, Mom, I hope you, uh, I will tell your story, I hope you're proud of me. Now I obviously look to those same heavens and tell my mom and my dad, I hope you're proud of me, I will tell your story. Thank you very much. Um, and then Ron, uh, Steve. Well, we're gonna have a special guest if I can. Eva, how are you today? I'll type it. Oops, oops. Ah, da, da, da. Eva, tell us about your high school. After the war, in October of 1945, we entered school and we went to high school in the big city where my aunt lived for five years. And we were just about ready to, at age 16, we were very advanced, ready to get our high school diploma. But because we got our visa, we were not willing to stick around. So we left Romania without a high school diploma. I arrived in Israel speaking no, no Hebrew. Now we had to learn Hebrew and learn about Jewish history, Jewish literature, language, and Bible. And Bible was the biggest problem. I had to learn 40 chapters by heart, which I couldn't possibly learn. And I flunked Bible three times. I could not get my high school diploma in Israel. And so I arrived in the United States after I married my husband without a high school diploma. I learned a lot of English. I learned English very fast, and one of the best ways in addition to watching television was that my children were growing up, and they wanted me to read them fairy tales. And I loved those fairy tales, because I, have, I could understand the words. It was the level of my English knowledge, and I read them with great enthusiasm, and I continued to read with my children. And then one of my friends suggested that I knew enough English to get a high school diploma. And I needed a high school diploma because I wanted to be a realtor and I couldn't go to real estate school without it. So I applied for a test, a GED, and I passed it immediately, got my high school diploma. Now that I had a high school diploma, I wanted a college degree. So I decided to go to school and actually a funny story. I took my first class was Holocaust education and I went up to the professor and I told him that I hoped I wasn't going to flunk his class because it would have been very embarrassing to survive the real thing and flunk his class. He didn't understand what I was saying, but that was the reason that I took Holocaust 101, because the academic world was very threatening to me, and I wanted something that I was familiar with. I went to college for 11 years and graduated in 1990 with a degree, Bachelor of Science. And I'm glad I did the work because I feel very proud to be able to accomplish that. So um, happy to answer your questions, or if you want me to ask my mom questions, and then I'm going to, we can do it this way, however you want. I just want to give you an opportunity. I know I ran over a little bit, so I apologize. Yes, sir. We, 
Well, we all know, I even, we know that 6 million Jews died, of which 1.5 were um, children. There were 5 million others killed, whether they were dwarfs, uh, homosexuals, lesbians, um, disabilities, absolutely, I know about that. Um, the, one of the interesting, sad things is that the youth, euthanasia program that Hitler and his henchmen used to advance their thought, believe it or not, a lot of that started in the state of Indiana in the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And so um, my mom... My mom did most of the research, and I learned from my mom. But uh, yes, of course, there were, it was this, this Holocaust, this terrible hate was not just um, focused on Jewish people. It was also focused on disadvantaged people and other people who didn't fit the Aryan race. Yes. Other questions? OK. Yes, Dr. Granoff. <laughs> Well, you're on the paid, paid, uh, <laughs> no, yeah. But, um, Alex, do you go and just, where this is, I, I would just sit and just talk with her for hours. I mean, I'd be like, Mom, I miss you. I yeah. think that sounds weird, but. No. So when, when this was created by the USC Shoah Foundation, um, Steven Spielberg started Shoah Foundation. Steven Smith, who's a good friend, is the one that interviewed my mom. Um, this was created before my mom died, so this was actually at Candles. My mom used to have arguments with herself. I have a video of my mom talking to herself, having arguments. And so I wish I had one of my dad. Stephen Smith actually said even though my dad passed away, he could recreate my dad, AI. And so, yeah, I, when I have medical students with me, I'll bring this out and say, do you want to talk to somebody? And they look at me. And so, yeah, I, I do it a fair amount. Um, but it's the whole story behind this is that she was in a studio for about 10 days in Southern California. I think I went out there the fourth day and Stephen would sit and there were like hundreds of cameras and she would always wear her, you know, blue, we call it Eva blue. And she would answer any question. I and mean, we'll, we'll hear at the end, I'm going to do one quick thing, but she can almost answer anything. The funny story is on about the sixth day, they would give all the survivors a day off. Most of them would go to Rodeo Drive to shop. So my mom went to Watts to lecture to kids behind barbed wire. And so she didn't go shop. So she would say, look, I too am used to being behind barbed wire. And uh, one of the things was that you know all the kids had hoodies, torn jeans. And so she came back that day. I said, how'd it go? She goes, well, the kids were great. I feel bad for them. But they all wore these hoodies. So the last night after the last interview, Stephen had a party at his house, Stephen Smith. And so she, he gave my mom a present was a hoodie, sweatshirt. I survived Auschwitz, and all I got was a sweatshirt or hoodie. <laughs> so if you go online and Google Stephen Smith, Eva Kaur, the first or second entry is his PowerPoint that he did at my mom's celebration of life. It's very funny. I haven't gone into it because of time, but it's hilarious. My mom was not the original 12 chosen. She chose them. Yeah. Any other questions? I, yes, sir. Yeah, so um, so my, we would go to Auschwitz, I mean, every June and then on the anniversaries. And so she was adamant, uh, June, late June 2019, she was going to go. Um, that'll feed into what I'm going to. And so um, she, every now and then she would get upper respiratory tract infections. In the last couple of years of her life, we had a nurse with us. And so um, on July 3rd, we were at Auschwitz, and she took the morning off, but she came over uh, at lunch. We had a group. We have, Usually there were 100 people from all over the United States with our candles group. And so we're about to start the group. My mom pulls up in, in the golf cart. And so somebody in our group says, because I don't think you know the story, uh, somebody said, oh, there's a group from Los Angeles, a young men's ensemble that wants to sing serenade to your mom. I said, no, no, we don't have enough time. Because I, I was, I, somebody said, no, no, really, let, my, your mom will like it. I said, okay. So they start singing in Yiddish. And my mom says, no, 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 no. I want you to sing my favorite song, Man from La Mancha, Dream the Impossible Dream. So Stephen Cronauer, who's the director of the group, said, well, Eva, we don't know the song. And my mom said, well, I know the song. So she sings, they sing, and they then sing all her other songs. 
And by this time, there's a huge crowd in front of the tower, the Bear Canal Tower. I'd never seen this. Everybody's crying. These kids sound like angels. The next morning in our hotel room, my mom died. And so um, that's the long story made short. So um, she was preparing a speech that she wanted to write and give. She was for the 20th, for the uh, 75th anniversary in 2020. Michael Berenbaum, who all of you probably know, came to the hotel July 2nd, July 3rd to help her work on the speech. He said my mom's speech uh, eight months later. So there was a question up there. Yes, Chuck. Well, I mean, when my mom was in Montana, she once met a kid who was now in his 20s that was part of a far-right neo-Nazi movement. And she, he then saw the light, and he met my mom, and she forgave him. So my mom would simply, for people that said the Holocaust never happened, she always in her purse had the letter that Dr. Mooch signed always had the Declaration of Amnesty. So she would pull it out and say, look, you can't deny it. Dr. Munch was a Nazi. He is saying here that there was a Holocaust. For all the people, whether it's far right, far left, I'm not getting into politics, no matter who would say there was no Holocaust and say this never occurred, who had anti-Semitic views, she would simply take out this letter and say, look, you can't, you can't denounce that. This is fact. And so um, just to give you um, the president of Iran, I always mess up his name, Ahmadinejad, years ago, was saying the Holocaust never occurred. So my mom, very creative, did a, a video, and she found the email address for the president of Iran. <laughs> so she videotaped herself at Auschwitz, or I'm sorry, at the museum with the liberation picture, and said, "Dear President Iran." Look, I'm right here. This is me in the picture 70 years ago. I'm inviting you to Auschwitz to go with us to the next time we go on a trip so you can see for your old, yourself that this occurred. He responded, but he didn't come. He did respond. I'm going to finish up with this, and if you have any other questions, one last thing. Mom, Eva, what's your favorite song? Well, my, my most, most favorite song is the Man from La Mancha, The Impossible Dream. I'll try. To dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe, to try when your arms are too weary, to reach the unreachable star. This is my quest to follow that star. No matter how hopeless, no matter how far to, I think that's about it I can remember right now. I know to reach the impossible dream. Thank you very much. Thanks to Stephen, Ron, the Dean. I thank you all for your time. <laughs>